first of the now speakers uh, this uh, semester. The format basically is that uh, our speaker will, uh, will talk about an issue um, of relevance to them and uh, to us for about 20 minutes to half an hour. And then we just open it up to, to, to all of us. Uh, I think you all know by now that because there have been announcements and that uh, uh, Hanif Kara teaches here at the GSB, is currently teaching a, a course on um, the art of the engineer. He has been coming to the GSB for the past few years. He is a partner in a firm in London called AKT, stands for Adams Kara Taylor. Uh, they um, started over 10 years ago in London, um, the three partners. And since then, they have grown to over 200 uh, people in the office. Uh, they uh, work with uh, a number of firms internationally, uh, including Professor Silvetti, who is uh, here in the audience. Um, and so I think that's one of the great things about the firm is that they are really dealing with a whole variety and spectrum of uh, practices. And I don't know, maybe Hanif will uh, touch base uh, on that uh, as well. Uh, last year, Hanif actually was appointed to be the Pierce Anderson uh, Creative Engineering here at the GSD. And uh, recently, uh, he has been the editor of a book about their firm, which is this book called Design Engineering, AKT. It's published by um, Akhtar uh, from uh, Barcelona. And I think this book is now uh, readily available and has got uh, a lot of material that I would really recommend uh, to you. In addition to um, the work in the, uh, in the office, I think one of the things that's really unusual is that, that uh, in many respects, Hanif, in the context of the UK, is also operating in a way as a kind of public intellectual related to the field of design and engineering. He's a commissioner of CAVE, which is a commission for the built environment, and they really make decisions about the design of various uh, buildings. And I think he has also been working in a, in a genuinely kind of collaborative fashion with a number of um, uh, architects um, uh, around the world, and I think it's, it's, I've asked him to speak about that, about really what is the, what is the situation in terms of the relation between design and engineering. I think we know, for example, the case of uh, uh, a number of other engineers who played a very important role, and I think what is, what is important is to, to have him speak about how he positions himself and how he sees really the, the importance of uh, of that, uh, of that role, and maybe we can uh, speculate. Plus, maybe, I don't know if there'll be time for him to touch on more sort of uh, broader issues connected, for example, to pay if you, if you wish. But in any case, uh, I don't want to take up the 20 minutes <laughs> all by myself without any further delay. Please uh, welcome to the car. I'm going to try and provoke uh, I hate text slides, but I had to just make up some words. Uh, I'm going to try to provoke a few points and maybe show you, illustrate what I mean by them with some philosophical ideas, and then maybe show you current pro two or three current projects. I could do this for five hours if I really uh, had the time. But five points I want to make. One is that um, generally, as an observer, my view is that many architects are uh, perceiving structural engineers as parallel practitioners, because you see us as people with knowledge and means to innovate structural design and probably people who have closer knowledge of construction and fabrication. That's one observation that at least I see that's slightly inaccurate. The AKT model has tried to promote uh, a different kind of pluralistic model of engineering, so positioning ourselves. Why I call it truly what I would call it is, is really collaborative compared to some of the others um, that, that we can talk about in a minute. And we do that primarily through a very adaptive, literally adaptive structure in the office. Like I'll show you what I mean by that. So that that structure can actually deal with 
the many derivative and diverse questions that architects ask us or we frame with the architect. So we're trying to adapt to all of these different ways of thinking, neither as a creator nor as a problem solver. That's where we sit. We don't see ourselves either of those two things. We've kind of um, put this in the in a context of design engineering, which is quite a common paradigm. But our particular um, understanding or explanation of that in the book is that it's more, it goes beyond having a technical competence, that's a given. Having an aesthetic um, appreciation, that's also a given. Those two things do not differentiate a structural engineer today. You've got to go way beyond that. So our meaning of design engineering tries to lock or at least connect with three legs. There's a construction leg, so we're very good at how things are made and built. There's the leg of practice in structural engineering. And then the third leg is education, how we all educate each other and how education is actually affecting the other two legs. The, the, the fourth point about that is this model then, in, in its simplest way, is the single word <laughs> definition of it is the, the empathetic structural engineer, meaning that we can sit very comfortably um, in the shoes of the architect or a developer or a constructor, but we choose also very carefully from all of those three tribes the people we actually want to engage with, so, we don't, we, so that we don't become part of the general noise of structural engineering. The last point to make um, is that this kind of thinking and this kind of approach in the last 10 years, and, and for engineers you have to remember the narrative can't begin on year one, it's reverse. You know, we have to build a lot before anybody listens to anything we have to say. It's not like you, you could write books as architects, do nothing forever and be fine. We have to make buildings stand up very quickly so we can then <coughs> reverse engineer a narrative. So from that perspective and the four points I've made, um, I think that we are finding ourselves in the space between the disciplines. So that. Multidisciplinary as a model to us is dead. We are pure structural engineers. We are interdisciplinary, so we organize ourselves such that those boundaries between disciplines that nobody wants to really deal with, um, and we're going to examples of that, we operate in that, that area. Often in the US particularly, it's where all the lawyers operate, we find. So we thrive in an environment which has high risk in between the disciplines, and I think that's part of the way we, we design at least uh, the way we describe design engineering. What that allows us is more than build, you know, that's just one part of it. But really the intention is to, to develop a shared discourse over time. For us now, it's, it's kind of year one of that discourse. And that, that space between the disciplines and the construction and design. So, whilst ten years ago, you know, the practice started, all we had to do was really connect to new ideas in architecture. Today, that is not sufficient for us. New ideas in architecture do not allow us to, to operate. I'm going to fly very quickly through a couple of slides. There was a paper in a, in a magazine in the, in the US, a couple of, I think maybe last August, talking about the engineer's moment, which was typical of how um, I think journalists and uh, practitioners are, and uh, those who don't actually do the work read the way engineers work. This, this huge atlas of engineers made stars out of a number of people, including myself, telling everyone how it was our moment in architecture. Don't agree with it, I'm afraid. Um, you can't see it, probably, but I wanted to say something about discipline itself. The, over the, you know, one of the things I've learned from architects is how to do 2,000 years of research in a day. We were all very good at that stuff. So we, we've done that as well, and what we found is that our discipline is really only 200 years old. You know, over the, over the time in architecture, as we've gone from that left-hand model of the elephant carrying the bird to the model of the bird carrying the elephant, what has happened is you need calculations, you need all these clever things, and you're therefore allowing the engineer to appear. Second point to make, what differentiates engineers today? Um, and, and any really quality of, of uh, service, let's say, or designer, there are only two real ones, two real, think of many agendas, 
but quality and innovation. That's the two things that we think repeatedly, frequent innovation in every work, everything we do, either in process or the work, is what we aim for as a differentiator. How do we feed that machine then? Well, one of the tactics is to, to cross-breed um, the, the stand that all of the avant-garde architects are taking. So this is just eight people that we work with, Zaha, BIG, George Rajandra, Fosters, Thomas Edelman, Goldstock, HMM, and FOA. One idea is to understand what they would like to do. So in Zaha's case, she says, I like to make things look difficult. We engage with that as an agenda. <laughs> I, I don't want to read all of the others, but we not only engage with that, but going back to my adaptive idea, we try and adapt to that. These people never talk to each other. They talk to me. So I can translate stuff across these skills and actually breed, cross-breed without them even knowing what's going on. Um, what has happened in engineering is this diagram, very simply speaking, in the last 10 years, the big thing that has happened is we've developed forensic tools rather than just form tools. So what we can do as engineers is almost anything we want. The difference is the engineers that are actually better are the ones who want to ask the question of why you want to do that, not just produce what it is you draw. We've found these tools then that become weapons often. What we find in that uh, sort of discussion or discourse is the design process itself is lagging behind, fabrication is lagging behind even further, but most of all, skills and education we think are way behind. So really, we're the leaders of the world in this discipline, in this discipline, disruption of the world. We're way ahead of you and everybody else that's doing these things that are far beyond this idea. In terms of tools, there's two things to say about the analysis. Um, you know, one the good side of our tools in the, in the previous diagram is speed. So something we could do in days in 1985, today takes us 45 seconds to do. The other problem with it, so I'm saying that as a promoter of technology and tools, really fantastic thing to do to create your work, and we really love engaging with this. But what we are finding is that um, the majority of the, the production of, these, of, of architecture and this course, or buildings, is tool driven today and what's happening is you get this ship made out of all these different software packages and you end up with a situation where the compass no longer works it doesn't know where it's headed so the, diff the problem with technology has also become that many of the bad architects and there are many of you around are hanging your architecture onto us or to the tools that you have we don't do that with our tools I've got a should I keep going? Yeah. So, is it an adaptive <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to keep going if you want. Um, we've been very literal in terms of the brand because, you know, with, with engineers, we have to talk about love and money at the same time, unlike you. You guys don't just talk about love all the time. So, what we have to do is cooperate across this field. And one of the things we've done is eventually have to, because our, a third of our work is developers and clients directly. We've had to have a corporate identity, and we're playing literally the game of using the flock that, that adapts itself, in our, even in our emblem. <coughs> the practice is organized like this as a studio, so what I mean by uh, an environment that, that creates this kind of innovation and quality is a spiral organization where the leaders, the, the most experienced guys on top and the least experienced people in the office at the bottom of the spiral can actually connect very quickly, and then the gradient between them is very simple. The point being that inexperience is actually as important as experience. So the power of having to relearn something very quickly from the younger uh, guy coming in the office is extremely important to us. This model is also wonderful when it comes to sharing the profit. If you stretch it, you take most of the money at the top, and the guy at the bottom gets um, less. That's it. Um, one more slide. If you leave it to us, though, um, to do architecture, this is my final position. This is what happens. We make it. This is the perfect human body that would live 100 years. We'd have to do all these things to it. And this is what quantity surveyors, structural engineers, and all, many of the other disciplines around architecture do. We do efficient things, things that are technologically efficient, things that work well, but they're really ugly. 
<laughs> no, the difference is that for me, as, as a position now, is that I wouldn't like this guy to, to reproduce children. So that's very important to me to not actually end up here. I'd like architects to take up more of the, uh, the challenge of trying to avoid that. Can I stop with that? Are you going to show some of the work? Shall I show it? Yeah, I think it's, we have the, I think it would be good to show some um, examples of, I mean, you kind of like, made a lot of uh, claims. We could for them to see if, if the claims are true. Well, I, you can go to the website. <laughs> well, I'll try and show you quickly, maybe from another presentation, uh, current projects. So there's obviously a lot of old projects that are on, uh, on the website, but also one being shown in the exhibition there with Fashin and Alejandro. I'll show you what's on the board at the moment. This is Sheikh Said with, in, in Abu Dhabi with Foster Partners, where we won the competition together. Now it's being formed, it's, a, it's, it's the largest museum on the, on the island, and it is for the shape itself. So this one, we believe, has quite a, a way to go, but has the content already. And what our role has been in this is not just form making, um, but also in presenting the work um, in the way that local contractors and local construction people can build up a certain confidence, so they can actually build what fosters are drawing. I'll show you quickly, this project is now common, commonly known. We're actually on site with the first building in Mazda, which is MIST with Foster Partners, which is the university block um, connected to MIT somehow. Uh, that's six weeks into construction now, and we're on the third floor. I'm just going to give you a few presents. A stadium in, in India with Cricket Stadium. Cricket is big, so we went there very quickly, as soon as we heard about that. And they wanted some design-led um, stadiums, let's say, rather than the st stuff that they've got at the moment. So we won a competition with Michael Hopkins over there, and we're on site with this project now. With Zaha's office, um, we have at least 10 projects, but I'll show you one, which is the Hyder Ali project, which is a museum come uh, gallery come entertainment space in Baku in Azerbaijan. A lot of work has been done, but I've put up the computation work on this because what it's been about is really with that very beautiful shape, you know, question of taste, but that, the, the client loves that shape. And what we've been doing quite in-house, developing a, a way of actually writing software that would connect analysis design and construction properly. Um, and also find the right materials that will fit all all the time on this uh, shape. That's the project. Okay. Sorry. Um, so I think uh, it would be good just to uh, hear a little bit more um, explanation of a few things um, before we open the thing up. And for example, you talked about. Uh, the way in which the field of engineering has changed, going from the elephant supporting the bird to the bird supporting the elephant. And this concept of forensic tools right, and form tools. Um, can you explain a little bit more what does that mean and what are the kind of implications from your perspective of the use of forensic tools for architecture and its relation to engineering? If we're going to use them in a good way, the thing that they're doing is allowing that real um, connection between macro and micro. So we're able to go from, and I could have shown a project like that, go from a city scale to almost zoom right into a very detailed pile foundation in a particular building at one level at speed, but also without, um, because we're no longer relying on human interaction for that easy part, which is the calculations. It's freeing up engineers to be the intuitive and clever thinkers again, whilst the tools themselves are doing 50 times the amount of work that a normal hand calculation. So it's doing two things. One is it's allowing us to get closer and closer to understanding materials of nature better. So in theory, we can actually get closer to nature. And the other thing it's doing for certainly the Western half, let's say, 
is allowing us to step back because most of that work can be done almost anywhere in the world if you've got the tools. So as creative engineers, you need to step back and actually go backwards to what creative engineering does. Just innovate more, conceptualizing a lot more, having a, a com comfortable feeling that that can be done. So um, if these forensic tools are helpful in terms of you um, being able to innovate, you mentioned also the pairing of quality and innovation. Who, who decides uh, what is innovative? What do you mean by innovation? Give us some sense of what you consider to be innovative. And who decides what is quality? Uh, in because now you, in a sense, sort of abdicated that responsibility to the architect by saying you, in a way, I mean to be, to be just blunt about it, saying maybe the engineer is not qualified to make aesthetic judgment. So who, who decides quality? Well, I shouldn't, first of all, I should take back if I gave the impression that you're entirely responsible for aesthetic judgment. <laughs> um, I, I didn't show my last slide, maybe I jumped it, but let me just show it quickly. What, what I, I help decide what, what is aesthetically pleasing as well. I don't sit back as an engineer in doing that. The difference is that the first statement I made about, so this is me, when you hit your hammer on the thumb, I feel the pain. There's a difference between that approach, the empathetic approach of an engineer, so I can appreciate your, your aesthetic value, compared to the parallel practitioners in engineering who are imposing engineering as a way of doing architecture. There are many who are actually just and architects are encouraging this, particularly the bad ones. You know, they will draw, construct the longest span or the biggest cantilever and say that's architecture. And there are engineers who are doing that as well, you know, saying, I can do with my tool this stuff. And if the tallest building in the world, never asking the question why, or never stopping to say, I think that's ugly. So the word beauty is quite important to me personally. And I think that in, certainly in our case, how we define innovation and quality of space starts from the origin of the project. We've been selectively careful in choosing uh, what's pleasing to us as a client or as a project. The eight people I showed are, are world-class architects, and there are many like that that we work with. In the same way, we've been very selective about working with the coolest developer and the biggest developer to mix this idea about love and money but at the same time. So we, we, we find that innovation is not something you can just lay out, but it's a cultural thing within the office. If you create an environment that allows people to question everything all the time, you find sometimes really old ideas turn into something new and shiny, but are quite innovative when you bring it back to the table. So, but I think that's the point that you need still more uh, in a sense, explanation because part of your argument is that unlike certain engineers who would have some um, pre established principles in terms of a kind of project of rationality what is correct, what is not correct, what makes sense, what doesn't make sense you are part of a, maybe a, a, a much smaller group of people who think more opportunistically in terms of the kind of conditions that are available, the realities of, of the marketplace, the kind of situations that architects are facing, you yourself are facing, and, and being in one sense sort of more pragmatic and dealing with quality and innovation through a sort of mode of pragmatism, if I yeah. understand it yeah. correctly. Yeah. But I still think that, that you know, they, they, there is no sort of God-given uh, reality that all the architects that you're working with are correct, for example. So I know that you're saying they are they are some of the best and, and so on and so forth. But I'm still looking for the way in which you can give very precise examples in some sense of what constitutes advancement in terms of I mean you've done that previously, I know for example in terms of in terms of the Peckham Library, where the way that you work with uh, with with also that has you know what also wanted and what you proposed. You know, but in some of these examples, that, because you went through them quickly, it's hard to sort of understand where is the specific moment where quality and innovation occurs and what is the nature of the collaboration that actually makes the relationship between the two produce something that 
they would be produced by themselves in some way. I think that that's what you, that's what I'm in some ways looking for. Yeah, no, I understand. Or, I think I understand. I, people can't see this, but, but what I draw here is uh, where we operate. So if you took this example, as a flat example, perceived complexity and perceived efficiency as two flat planes, x and, and y, x and z, etc., um, curves, there's an assumption that structural efficiency reduces as complexity. What I've been doing for a long time is proving the reverse. Actually, the more complicated something gets, it actually there's a potential for it to become more and more efficient structurally. Similarly, the technological efficiency doesn't necessarily prove just because it does something. The difference is that there is an area of compromise in both, which is where we operate. And when you add the third dimension to it, which is the bit we bring, which is the qualitative. Uh, client trust, which they don't have always in their architects, all the ones that we're working with, we are able to then say, we think this will look better, Mr. Client, it will take it better from us than it does from the architect, often, we find. So adding a, a third dimension to, to the kind of area of compromise that we're working in, we don't believe in um, construct the most efficient construction system as being the most beautiful in the world of engineering. That's probably it. You know, so we will do things that are slightly more difficult and inefficient structurally in order to get a better space or to get something beyond technical efficiency, let's say. And that plays out in all of the work because most of the time the sort of people we're working with have developed it's a developed culture within their own organizations. And when you bring the sort of culture I've been talking about, that they're fairly good engineers, a lot of these people. What then happens is that there's a given acceptance that they know something about what we do and we know something about what they do. Therefore, you have a better opportunity to create something more interesting as a collaborative model. Uh, so how are these ideas actually reflected <coughs> in the structural organization of your office? Because going back to the point that you mentioned about skills and education, you also said that you, know, you were in a sense, ahead of the curve, you were ahead of yeah. what architects were doing. So I think it would be good to understand yeah. what you mean by that, what you've done in your own office to make that possible, what recommendations you have for architectural offices to be able to also respond to this question of, of skills and education to be to be as uh, savvy as, as, as yeah. you are. No. <laughs> Some people in here know me quite well, but there's a, there's a, I mean, there's a couple of things to say. In general, my observation so far of what I've seen, and this is generalizing in the States, is, um, if they, well, let's start the other way around. I think there's no, no doubt that you have to be talented. There's no doubt you have to have passion for what you do. Otherwise, you, you know, you just don't forget architecture. The, the third one is the difficult one in this room because I, I find certainly an um, outcome is important, not output. But nonetheless, the output that I see from students in, in this world, in the States, is way, way down there compared to what I see in Europe. So there's, they seem, at least on the face of it, I'm be killed out there, lazy. They don't seem to realize that you've got to do all of these things quick and many, many more times in order to get there. So one advice I would give you is, if you don't have the, the body to, to or mind to stay for the long game, that you should get out of architecture quickly. That's one piece of advice. But what, what generally, um, I would say, I don't know. As if there wasn't enough pressure or <laughs> well, But, it is. but I, I think it's important that we, we talk about that. But it, if you repeat your question again. So. Well, I was just wondering how you are talking, discussing the kind of question of skills and education. Okay. In, how in, you are organizing sure. your office to be able to produce the kind of work that is in a sense responsible. Yeah, to sorry, I forgot my point. The, the, the most important thing is there's no money for research and development. So what we've done as an organization is we haven't created a separate group that innovates. What we try to do is all engineers in the office are trained in a certain way. So when we come out of university, I mean, structural engineering education is much worse than architectural education. And our institution is way behind yours as institutional organizations. They don't innovate, most institutions. So 
as a practice of we, we suggested that sort of how we're doing the discipline needs to change. Having said all this, how do we do that? One of the things is that we come up with an undergraduate and postgraduate degree of very technically competent, but what we need is all the other skills in, in the engineering office. So we have been, through the educational system, uh, formed a group which now is 15% of our organization. It's called PART, which is part of our work. And in that group, and that group is available free of charge to anyone in the office to engage with, has computational people, architects, graphic designers, a, a number of other disciplines that allow the structural engineer to sharpen his tool, in a way, the, the tool of structural engineering, not to stray away from that, not to suddenly become a graphic designer or a computer scientist, but really to have that ability to communicate and decipher what the other side is trying to get across to them. That's something that we take on the bottom line. So it's not an on cost to our client. It's, it's when you start forming these things separately that clients don't like it because they feel you're paying, you're paying for extra value. What we've done is really taken that as a no cost item within the organization. So you're, you know, as an organized, as that spiral was trying to say, if you're one of the brighter guys who wants to get to the top quicker, you will work with these guys and do something interesting sooner. So it's very merit driven rather than how many years of experience you've got. And maybe one last thing before I open it. I, I've known you for a long time and you've been, you've been of course, teaching in the context of the design studio uh, in London and now the kind of things that you're doing here. Just based on your experience of the past, let's say, seven, eight years, I wonder if you can speculate on what are the kind of um, milieu circumstances um, of education of, you know, for, for the production of design work that you think are interesting, beneficial, that you, in a sense, kind of recommend to us as models for uh, design practice, for educational uh, practice, just in terms of, this is specifically about collaboration, because you always work an architect and an engineer together in the studio. Do you see that as a positive model? Do you have other thoughts about it? How do you think these things have been? Today, there's a lot of discussion, for example, in our school about the concept of integrated design and integration being a way of like bringing different uh, consultants to the studio and having people work together in a sort of group of three, four, five people. Just speculate for a second about uh, yeah, pedagogy no. in relation. I, I think even at the pedagogical level, you have to be able to separate between multidisciplinary integration and interdisciplinary integration. It's a very fine line. And that line can get very thick in the multidisciplinary situations. So what you then get is you get a lack of cooperation between people, even though they're in the same room or discussing, because the level of education or, or aspiration isn't the same. To thin the line down, you just need like-minded people in that. So interdisciplinary means, to me at least, that the structural engineer, for instance, is a super expert in his field and is fairly good at other fields. And the architect is a super expert in his field and fairly good at structural engineering or other disciplines. So he's actually able to ask the right questions rather than just get the facade engineer to do the facade or the wind engineer or the climate engineer to do the climate. So I think that there's this, this in a, in a pedagogical level, this can be done, I think, by uh, introducing disciplines, but not just or mechanically, by picking on the best engineering school and putting it together with the best architecture school, you won't get it necessarily. It's a way of actually trying to somehow create a situation. I found it quite successful, um, you know, at the DRL, as you know, where we've had to go in, you know, kind of one extreme to the other, so trying to connect two extremes in a collaboration, where, you know, they've been thinking for many years about projects never built one, so having to, forcing them last year to build one got us much closer and pedagogically I think it's going to help them rethink how they do it over the next few years. The other point I would make is that the connection between schools and practitioners, and I would say this, is very important. I mean, I see it in two forms. One is those that are glad to be their practitioners. There's lots of them. They go to lots of universities and they're just glad to be there. 
and those that are really engaged, and the vice versa also works, I think. So that's one thing that's important. That, the, the, that can be exploited a bit more. Um, the, the dilemma for most universities, I guess, is that there's a lot of people, highly qualified people, who've been there you know, 30, 40 years. And how do you make room for people coming in for a temporary situation? But I do believe that that must be the way forward, where you have different ideas for a number of years, rather than one idea for a long time, you know, some, some way of actually changing the pedagogical uh, structure, so you encourage that. Mix experience and inexperience in a way. So maybe I could, um, I, I do want to ask you about the CAPE and your role within now kind of wider thing, if you, if you want in a second, but maybe we can um, get some uh, questions, responses. I think Hanif has put a lot of issues uh, on the table, and I wonder if uh, there, are, there are questions that you have, or please. How do you see the state of education, and maybe, how do you see the state of education for an architect in terms of understanding how things are made physically at the graduate level, Europe, US, everywhere? Is it adequate? Does it need well, I, I, more stress? No, it does, but I think one of the, I have to go back to when I was a graduate, and I used to go and look at buildings without my teachers telling me. I used to find the detail for cladding, you know, I used to go and do those things. I don't think it's all down to the teachers or the way we frame the syllabus. I think it's also down to those who want to continue in this in architecture. You need to understand that, you know, you look, I get this at architecture school all the time. How big shall I make my column? And then I touch one and say, look, that's it. You need to know, I mean, you need to observe what's around you to understand what it can pick up. <laughs> so one point, one point is that, is that not always to, to find new ways of getting them to learn how to make things. That isn't that difficult. But on the, on the reverse side, I think one of the ways in which you can do this is bring in more, at undergraduate level, bring in more constructors as well, rather than just you know, designers like myself or consultants connect better with constructors. And there isn't a lack of them wanting to do this. There are people who want to do it with, with the right people. Engineering schools can do it. The problem they have is that they end up patenting something too early and so on and so on. But with architecture, I think there's a way of bringing in you know, selective um, constructors into the discussion early at the graduate level. Um, you said your firm is, you set up a firm that works on R&D through its projects, so I'm wondering what are some of the engineering questions or design questions that you are sort of ongoing teeing up in your firm and investigating? Well, today, I mean, it's, it's a long one, that, because I, you know, I can show you a whole load of structures, but for example, if you took one of our last projects was Fino Science Center. The Fino Science Center was made out of self-compacting concrete which had hardly been used at that scale. And that research that had to be done was not funded by anyone else. We chose to make the research ourselves and actually pay for the whole system, thing to work in order to get appro approval of it in Germany. So we have material research that comes as a consequence of an ambition in the project. The other thing that we're trying to do, which is speculative uh, games, where we're trying to still and it's very hard, as Jordan knows, because he spent two years in the office trying to do this, trying to connect our tools with the tools of the fabricator and the tools of the, of the architect, because there isn't still a, a, a tool that does all of the things. So there's a few things like that going on in the office. Another type of uh, research that's going on is you know, forms, hybrid forms, because uh, the diagram that I, I was trying to jump across where you know, this used to be architecture as we knew it. Today, when you morph all these things, a beam is not a beam, an arch is not an arch. It's all, everything is in between something else. So what we're trying to do is really think of new hybrid forms that will do this. So bridges and towers combined and so on. This is just stuff we set up ourselves, but the majority of the work is done through our project. So recently, we've tested some really long glass beams with it. University, for example. Any other? 
Peter? Is that is there a mic? What? Okay. It's a very simple question. What are the, the tools that you use? What's the range of tools at your disposal in your office? The range from so all the architectural packages are all the ones everyone else uses, Rhinos, so and so on. And we have um, three different FE packages. Sophistic is the most advanced package. For, for very quick analysis, we use multi-frame, and that is very, we've actually compared, you know, when you do a quick analysis on one package, how much will it change later through case studies. Mm -hmm. So we know which one to use when. But there are also occasionally tools that we've had to write ourselves by commissioning a software um, specialist by asking them questions, not writing the tool ourselves, but actually <coughs> framing the question. For example, if you take Sophistic, there were things it couldn't do, and we had to actually say we want to do this irrespective of whatever the manufacturer says. We had to get in a computer scientist really to assist us in, in framing that and developing that software further, which then went back to the owners and is now licensed for this. You are ahead of us. <laughs> I just, that was provo provocation. <laughs> Um, hello. I'm sorry I had to arrive late, so I didn't see the talk, but I was curious because it had mentioned civil engineering, and I'm actually a landscape student here, and so I'm wondering um, how you approach the landscape and, and how about that the building relates to its surroundings, especially since so much of that is what we're trying to deal with as far as sustainability issues and things like that. And I was just wondering, you know, what the role of civil engineering is, and if you do also bring in landscape architects to help you really think about the building as a system. I, I, I have, a, again, and pushing the head and show the projects, but we have specifically targeted, um, so you missed the talk, but we've, we've been very strategic about who we work with, so we specifically target people like West State mm -hmm. and other very large landscape, including, and, and artists, by the way, because we have not stuck ourselves into the, the, the field of design and then say, okay, we'll only do buildings. We've engaged with the civil engineering component of most of our buildings and our one the green building of the year two years ago, which was for the site for the National Trust headquarters in the UK. So on, on every occasion, what we've tried to do is really identify a client and a group of consultants that are already leading in their field and join them as, in order to improve our knowledge. And we've then become one of the experts. But in my wider role as Cape Commissioner, I have a whole kind of discussion about placemaking and how we look after landscape it's, uh, for another time. Please, did you want to follow up? Um, I was just curious if you think at the graduate level that there should be more um, cross-disciplinary studios where architects and landscape architects can, and planners can actually engage Within, the, within their graduate education so that they understand how to talk to each other or, or how to understand the systems because I don't, I mean, if you just have an I don't know, I'm just, just wondering. I, I think the answer is yes. <laughs> or the answer could be no. No, <laughs> no I mean, uh, we, of course, I think you touched on two things. One is really the issue of, of collaboration broadly not just between architects and but architects, landscape architects, engineers. And then the other one is really specifically the role that civil engineering plays in relation to landscape practice. I, I, you know, one of the things that I, I really agree with, I mean, is the idea that, that today, basically, design education needs to be about more than design, or the way that we define design, we actually need to be experts at more things than probably we have been previously. <coughs> so I think it's very clear that in a school, uh, when we have so many option studios, and you've noticed this, for example, last semester, that we probably need to place some emphasis on the role of technology, technique, and the kind of investigation, for example, with, you know, both from geometry, computation, but actually, technical knowledge that provides a different kind of basis for uh, thinking, for imagining, and so on. I think it's also uh, the case, and I think schools of landscape architecture have been very slow in responding to this. 
that the, the, there is a fantastic tradition of uh, public works in, in landscape architecture, which is very much connected to, to this idea of uh, civil engineering, of the, the notion of infrastructure, and the understanding of this sort of, the, the interface between the landscape and the urban, which is mediated through engineering. And generally, schools of landscape architecture don't have enough engineers involved. You find that even in our school, we probably have more people under the rubric of the architecture department teaching engineering or structures, whatever, than in landscape architecture. And I think that this, but I think that, that a lot of people involved in teaching are very aware of that. It's just that it's also been a bit slow in kind of getting that side of it to develop. I, at the same time, we do have this kind of openness in our school. So, I think one of the ways would be that when somebody like Anit is here, that people from the Department of Landscape Architecture should also sign up, and it's an open thing. And they probably don't, to be honest, or not enough. Um, I, I'm curious to see how many landscape architects have signed up you know, for this. This year, now, last year, we had two. So I think that that's, that's something that we have to think about. I also think that the landscape architects tend to self-edit, so they, act, they don't they shy away a little bit from going towards this more civil engineering oriented. And part of it is, again, our fault for not encouraging that early enough and to instill the kind of skills that give people confidence to, to go in that direction. So it's kind of, it seems to me that it's a sort of bunch of issues that become together responsible for you know, the connection of going uh, not developing as systematically. I hope that in the next year or two we will see a lot more of that happening. And in fact, um, my friend uh, Professor Luis Ortega um, is obviously collaborating this semester in the architecture core with the landscape core, both in the second semester and the fourth semester. There will be like a one week, workshop. one week yeah. workshop We're on that, <laughs> that they are they are working on the on the on the workings of the workshop. Yes. <laughs> So, any other, please? Hi. I guess after um, hearing you know, about us lagging behind, though I would argue architecture doesn't always, um, maybe, it, you know, it doesn't always, it kind of does loops and it does some sort of detours, but I was just wondering who um, is in front of you and um, what the relationship is to the developers of like the most cutting edge technology because a lot of the things um, tools you're using do come trickle down from like you know kind of military um, research and um, yeah. Well two things. One is it's common knowledge that the building must be the built environment is obviously the worst in terms of you know we make a prototype and we watch it for hundred years compared to the rest of the world. So that this this you can't even compare us to, to all of that. But in terms of who's in front of uh, in front of us, I, I was meaning that all architects are behind us. I was saying like what I was trying to say was some of the best offices are there with us and ahead of us. So I still say and, and this is not to save my life or anything, architecture, the best architecture is where it all really begins. What I'm about is really reinforcing that as a grouping, let's say, in the world of architecture, to reinforce the fact that if you readdress and reorientate education and the way you think about yourselves, maybe the client will gain confidence again and we will gain more confidence rather than telling you how it actually works all the time and you believing in it. I can Photoshop all of these, nobody would know the difference. You know, I see it from, from students all the time, analysis packages. So, so if we can actually get some more confidence in architects through either education or encouraging them, that would be good for all of us. It would be just the world would just be a better place. I mean, I agree. Often you do see, you know, the rainbow, colorful image in an architecture, even you know, student projects, and then you don't really see um, what the impact is of it in, in the following parts of the project. But there are um, software packages now that allow you to retrieve geometry based on analysis. I mean, there's definitely some more tangible yes. ways of using them where maybe you could imagine um, the, the progression after the slides. 
Um, and I guess also one question would just be, well, do you, are you arguing that architectural education is behind engineering education? Um, are there things that they're, I, it's just really hard to compare the, okay, the two, obviously. The, the, but. I'm trying to say that both are, back, both are behind. Um, practices ahead of both education systems in some ways, and what people are doing in practice in some areas. But what, what I will say is that the reason the structural engineering education, at least in the UK, is behind is because it's still looking, um, it, it's framing itself around the technical competence bar in a way. So they're making super experts of say like Quake or whatever, one of those things. But they're really bad communicators and people who don't engage with space or they don't engage with, they can't speak about their work, for example. So it's not that we're ahead in the education world, nor in the, in the world of architecture. We have the other extreme. There are many architects who talk like an engineer. They show me this and say how it works. They haven't got a clue. So there's actually a, and there's somehow there's a way of actually bringing it all together to, for the betterment, rather than one being above the other, actually for the betterment of both somehow. I don't have the answers, but... Um, on, um, I was going to speak, but on that, on this just last comment, you know, sort of brings to my mind um, a question about the future, uh, which is look at ahead in terms of uh, education and practice, which is what we've been talking about. And considering, well, this, um, maybe the word is not confused, but this problematic situation which architects, you know, are behind on this and engineers are behind on that. And uh, considering, too, your incredibly uh, clear graphic about the length uh, in time in which the engineer as a profession had existed, and what we know about architecture, also that it has a very short period in that history. Uh, you know, there are still people alive in the field of architecture who used to go to schools of architecture or engineer to get a degree in architecture. So uh, all these things have been changing, and we know, practitioners, that things have changed in the last 20, 25 years. Incredible. We are really practicing differently. So just pure conjecture, but does it make any sense to see these models of separate schools when we are asking for so much collaboration? Um, is there a way in which can uh, very generally, you know, rethink the whole design profession as a, as a different organization of the disciplines? Because, you know, our thirst for more knowledge in engineering and technology is now doesn't seem to abate. <laughs> And, uh, and uh, the way we have uh, been working successfully with engineers have actually encouraged us to do more work. I just wonder, I mean, this is probably something we haven't answer today, but I think it's a question that is going to be posed sooner rather than later to academia, uh, because, you know, practice is evolving in a very uh, dra dramatic way. Right. Yeah. I would say that it's all related to risk. Um, even between Europe and here, there are more scenes in the U.S. I think that yeah. are, are risk averse. So it's easy in the in the uh, European scene for me at least to identify the enemy. It's usually the quantity surveyor, <laughs> the guy who costs a job. Yeah, <laughs> usually that guy. So from day one, you try and kill him on the project. That's, that, that's how it works. But it's difficult over here. It appears as though you have the lawyer, the project managers, yeah, the yeah. bad architects. Yeah. You know, there's a whole group of them which is difficult to get through. So I think it's really more how I'm not convinced that putting everybody on one in one school is a good idea. Like in fact, I'm against. How about in one office? Yeah. Well, I, I I don't agree necessarily with. You know, I came out of a very old model of multidisciplinary behavior, and what used to happen is you, you had in any three three good designers, you had two bad ones. So the service engineer would be awful if the structural engineer was good. And the architect was really good. So you never got the combination of all three really good people. And that's why I think you need to separate it. And I think you can play that back into education, in that if, if the pride in a particular um, discipline is what an educational institution wants, like pride in architecture, it should be allowed to do that at its best. And similarly, others, engineering rather than bring them all together because you will get 
you'll get second and third quality students if one is more dominant than another as a reputation. You know, one of the things that, that's happened, yeah. I think, in relation to the point that, that, that you're mentioning, is that um, in a way there used to be closer connection between architecture schools and engineering schools. Uh, even engineering schools used to have more emphasis on design. In a lot of engineering schools, like in civil engineering courses, the design component doesn't really exist mm -hmm. very much. Um, there are a few schools that still have uh, engineers and architects work together in the first year, like in the first semester, do some kind of a project. But generally, that seems to have sort of disappeared. Uh, what seems to be happening now that is different is the idea that the collaboration somehow is producing a different kind of work through the proximity mm -hmm. of people being together and that it's really the role of the architect and the role of the engineer um, and the role of the environmental systems people is being redefined. If anything, I, I am guessing that in the next few years we will in fact even see a much greater emphasis on the environmental people more than, than the structural engineers um, because we have been doing so many of the things linked to the notion of the expression of architecture, and I think that we will be really emphasizing a lot more the question of the performance of the building and its thermal, thermodynamic kind of environment. So I think we will be working more on those kinds of issues. So I think what's very interesting about what you're saying is that the collaboration means actually that maybe what I've sensed is that the model where we have a studio, then we have a course, and we have another course, and we have another course, and we somehow hope that by magic, things will kind of um, coalesce together, it don't. has certain limits, and that that doesn't happen. And that one needs both. One needs to have courses where people are really studying specific things. At the same time, we really need to have the, the environmental systems people and the structural engineer as part of the studio, which is what we are doing more. That is really the way that we're thinking through a project to look at. I think this, for most schools, this is a very difficult thing to do because actually in terms of the structure of time allocation, the financial side of it, the budget, all of these things, there's every reason why one shouldn't do that. And, and yet that's what one really needs to do. And I think that's going to be very important for us to, as a school, to kind of sit around and, and would think it, about this. But would it not be, or would it be right to say public to teenage sex? Said that basically all of these people, are like everybody talks about it. A couple of people do it, and maybe one lasts about two seconds when they do it. And this is how they can. That's what's happening next. If you're not careful as architect, you're going to get this big green guy coming in, telling you how to do your buildings, and and the danger you face. So, so I, I wouldn't really blame him. feel inadequate after this. <laughs> <laughs> the problem is we're opportunists. You know, engineers are taught to converge and, and, and take opportunities. That's how we are. We are you know, it's a very lean machine in that sense. What the architects need to do is actually learn what we taught about those games. So they're able to. I, I can tell you that some of the offices I work with, I would not get away with this discussion. Because they know. I work with them regularly, and we have, you know, charrettes when we're doing the competition, and they actually know a lot about what I do. So it's, I've always got to be not only as good as I am, but thinking about what is the next thing it's going to force me to do, and, and, and that's where I think schools need to get to somehow, mm -hmm. because being average is not is no longer good enough. Mediocrity surrounds us. Did you have a question? And then I know that um, it, uh, I'm not sure there is yeah. an answer to that question. I still have to get a response from you. Um, obviously, I think you are a, a structural engineer who understands the language of form and you know, from architects. So, to what extent that you think a structural engineer knowledge is appropriate for an architect? Yeah, in a way that they will understand their language, but not necessarily to, you know, go into certain depth of your profession and become a kind of you know, architect slash engineer. 
of course, if everybody can become architect slash engineer slash developer, everything that's wonderful. But due to the limitation of time, resource, all these situations, I think if to a certain level there is this common language can be established, it's certainly beneficial for architecture students or for architects that they can tell that what your graphics is representing, but not necessarily going back to calculate the forces, all those things by itself. I think that it's, it's a very good question because, as I said and I repeat it, you have to be a really good architect and a fairly good engineer. To become a fairly good engineer is not that. I'm a fairly good architect. Nobody told me that. I'm not an expert in here. So it's a way of actually, you know, the, the course that I'm doing tries to show this through case studies here because I think it's a way of communicating that to get to a certain level in any discipline doesn't take you a long time. You can become a chartered social engineer by the time you're 25 you know, in the UK, which is what I did. Then what do you do for the next one or five years? So it must be the same for architects in my opinion, that you can actually learn the basics of other disciplines. It, historically, you used to know this. It's only the risks that you didn't want to take that you've given away a lot of this stuff. Geometry is an example of that. You know, suddenly we're into parametrics. What's the difference between that and geometry? It's the same thing. So I, my, my, my answer would be, you don't need to know a lot more about structural engineering before you can make your architecture better. So you don't need to do a whole course and have to make a beam stand up. Those things are intuitive. You, you need to understand the basics of what questions to ask the engineer. But I guess that question is more from a pedagogical um, structure point of view. Because I mean, architects used to be the idea originator in the process of building. And now, for them to keep that role, they are challenged to learn as to know as much as they have to be. And structural engineer or others used to be the service provider to feed the information to the architect. So obviously, that status is shaking. And how, I mean, from the pedagogical structure point of view, that they can regain that without losing their identity of being the leader, being the idea originator of the project. Well, let's get this right. The best buildings that I've worked on, the architect has been the originator. He's just been forceful about it, even when he hasn't built anything ever before. He's just got the right people around him, but not allowed them to take over it. the architect. That's the difference. Uh, and I'm not, uh, I'm not evading your question. I think it's doable. Uh, guys behind you, two of them that I work with, might be able to expand. Yeah. Do you want, or there's a person? Yeah, 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 yeah. Just there's a bike that's coming, and then I can summon you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I, I was wondering, uh, uh, how did you address this, this question of the environment? I mean, uh, uh, structures are energy. Uh, yeah, can you speak to the mic, sir? Yeah, one way or another, you, you are dealing with energy problems, and maybe it is an, it may be different than environmentalists. But, but basically, you are dealing with energy, and and uh, you have talked so so passionately about uh, complexity. Uh, uh, that, uh, that it can be understood as as a uh, kind of entropic concept. No? And uh, I don't know if, if you have any kind of research in your office on this context. No? The relationship about the environment, energy, and structure. Basically. Yeah, no, we're just beginning some of that because, as you said, quite rightly said, if you look at the big pie chart on, on sustainability, the component that the structural engineer deals with, taking civil engineering out of it for a second, is only like 10% of the, the total pie, you know, because it's to do with embodied energy, the materials, and how we actually uh, make the material and transport them. So, as an expert in structural engineering, you don't really even have the, the best will in the world you don't necessarily contribute big time in the, in the discussion on sustainability. You do it in, in that sense. But what we have started to do, because we, as we get involved in larger structures and more cities, for example, we've started to open up new questions. Like we have a site in London at the moment, near St. Paul's, which has been piled. Power foundations is a problem that North America hasn't experienced yet. Common problem in, in, the, in Europe, as you know, 
we're piling for the fourth time on, on some of the most important sites. There's no room to come back and pile again. So we're stopping future construction on this site, and it's right next to St. Paul's, one of the most important places for us. And this is something that is a sustainability question. So what we've started to do is actually investigate and develop tools that can go back and, in, and give assurances on reusing piles, for example, or find ways of using old and new piles together to give a more sustainable uh, potential. So there is, there is work going on at city scale and at transportation and infrastructure scale. At the building scale, it's usually been, um, and, I, and I talk about complexity because I believe truly that to make things simple, you've got to go into complexity. It's the only way you can come back when you find what you're doing. But if you look at the work, the buildings that we've been associated with, you know, low-cost housing schemes or, or green buildings and, and so on, we haven't stuck ourselves just to say that we use second-hand steel, we use you know, bricks with lime mortar. Those are the many driven ideas. What we've tried to do is go really backwards on some of these to find out the origin of the material and push for a new way of manufacturing. So, for example, right now, we have a project in the office where we're looking at Adobe bricks being used for a project in East Africa, but actually put on not by human beings, but by robots, which is what everybody's doing in the world at the moment, bricks with robots. But we're trying to take this for a sustainable argument across from Malawi, which is a deep, deep argument. Maybe you'll have the last word, or the last question. Uh, I just have a question in terms of the architecture studio here in GSD. Uh, I mean, uh, the issues that we've been talking about uh, of the these ones, the experimenting the through the materials. I don't think in GSD we do enough uh, scale projects like one to one. And if it, if I have to give an example, I observed AA last year they did the DRL totally, which was maybe they had a budget like two hundred fifty thousand pounds, and which was a huge budget for such a project. I, I gave them the money. Yeah. <laughs> but they didn't come from the AA. Money that not, you should know that that didn't come from. Also know, I know, I know you should also know the students at the AA would go around looking for the funding. They wouldn't wait for me to get all the funding for them. So. But although I know there's been some uh, discrepancies in that project, there's, there was a good example how the students interacted with real issues and, and solved problems from the new languages that we use and actually make that into scale. So there was a great way to kind of experiment that. And here in GSC, I, I just maybe we should uh, focus on more one-to-one -one scale projects, which we have facilities and which we can actually produce, but which doesn't happen enough. In I this agree. Place. Uh, can I have your card after the lecture? Because I'm thinking about the same thing. So we should do something. Yeah, I should talk to Scott. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Anyway, if there, if there are no other urgent uh, questions, I want to thank Anin for taking the time and all of you. I think you know, it would be great discussion that has given us a lot of food for thought and how we can really begin to rethink certain aspects of, uh, of our program and our school. And I also will say he probably has room uh, for maybe one more student from landscape architecture. <laughs> <laughs> and any architects as well. We don't have enough architects on the course. They've been frightened by you saying what they say. There's a lot of people yeah. signed up from MIT <laughs> engineering, so he's, 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 he's ready. Thank you again very much.